G'day everyone, Lauren Cress, the business scientist here for another episode of What Science Says. And today we're talking about the placebo effect and the nocebo effect. Now, in my last video a couple of weeks ago, when we talked about what science is all about, I briefly mentioned the placebo and nocebo effect, but I felt like it really needed its own kind of episode. And I'm going to share three experiments as examples of the placebo effect and the nocebo effect as well. I'm saving the best one until the end. Absolutely bizarre study that was done on the nocebo effect. So let's start off with the placebo effect. What is the placebo effect? Essentially what the placebo effect is, is when patients experience improvement in their symptoms, despite the fact that they are not given a pharmacologically effective drug. They're essentially given some sort of like fake treatment, like it might be a sugar pill, it might be like a saline solution injection, it might be a sham surgery. And what happens is that the participant of the experiment reports feeling better. Now, this has been actually studied quite a lot in neuroscience now because we're trying to work out, well, why does this happen? Because there is an effect. And what neuroscientists are finding is that it's actually changes at the brain level, at the biochemical level, at the hormonal level that are having an effect on the outcomes reported by patients. Really, really interesting stuff. But there needs to be a few things that are kind of set up uh, to sort of induce the placebo effect. So things like we talk about context, for instance, like going into a therapeutical environment where you're speaking with a doctor or a healthcare professional, and they're telling you about what's going to happen as the result of taking this drug or putting this cream on a rash, etc. The context and the cues are really, really important for sort of setting up patient expectations and patient self-reporting as well. But what's really interesting is it doesn't just stop at the subjective level. So it doesn't just stop at patients going, I think I feel better or I think I feel less pain and reporting that they've had improvements from something that is essentially nothing. What's also happening is it's actually biochemical changes happening in the body. So they can be measured, they can be tracked. Now, I want to talk about experiments because I think this really helps to solidify what the placebo effect is all about. So the first experiment I'm going to talk about is an experiment that was conducted on people who experience migraines. So essentially what they did in this study is they wanted to look at how patients with chronic migraines felt after taking a popular migraine drug treatment or taking a placebo. And what they found was even when they had marked this pill box as placebo and the participants knew it was a placebo, the researchers still found that there was a 50% improvement from taking the sugar pill that was known to be a sugar pill. Now, what's really interesting about that and what the researchers said was that potentially even just taking the pill itself had an effect on feeling better. And that could be something to do with what we call associative learning. So associative learning is kind of like the classic Pavlov's dog experiment, where basically, uh, if you if you don't know, I'll just quickly explain it. But Pavlov has this dog, he rings this bell to let the dog know that the dog is going to get some food. So ring the bell, dog gets food. Ring the bell, dog gets food. The associative learning that the dog experiences is that when the bell is rung, the dog will get food. And so then the biochemical changes that the dog is about to get food are observed, like the dog salivates more because it's getting ready to eat something. Then Pavlov takes the food away and just starts ringing the bell. And the dog is still salivating because the dog's learned that when the bell happens, it's about to eat food. And that could be something that's happening here with the placebo effect is that we've learned throughout our lives, taking a pill means I'm going to feel better. And even if I know this is a sugar pill, I'm still going to feel better. It brings up some really interesting ethical questions as well. So we're going to talk about that a bit later, but let's talk about experiment two. 
So experiment two involves this milkshake. It's called Mind Over Milkshakes. Mindsets, not just nutrients, determine ghrelin response. Now, ghrelin is a hormone that's released to let us know whether or not we're satiated or full. So what happens is when we have an appetite, we have high ghrelin. And as we consume food, our ghrelin drops. It declines to say, okay, I'm full. I'm satiated. I don't need any more food. What they did is they got a 320 calorie milkshake. They told half of the participants that this milkshake was an indulgent milkshake. In fact, it had 620 calories. And in another experiment group, they said this was a sensible milkshake and it only had 160 calories. Now, remember, either way, all of the milkshakes have 320 calories in them. So they're getting exactly the same amount of food. What happened was in the indulgent group, we saw this steep decline in ghrelin. When the group who thought they were drinking a sensible low calorie milkshake drank the milkshake, they didn't have this decline in ghrelin. In fact, they had a relatively flat ghrelin response. There wasn't really any change in the level of ghrelin in their system. So basically their body was telling them, you're still hungry. And that is Super, super interesting to me because what that's telling us, like I said at the beginning, is this isn't just a self-reporting, I think I'm full. This isn't just a tick the box, this is a self-report of what I think. This is the body is actually saying you feel full or you don't feel full from consuming the same level of calories. Now, in this experiment, they controlled for things like health. They controlled for things like that person's normal appetite and eating. So there wasn't like, you know, in one group you had people who were really used to eating big amounts of food and another group, small amounts of food. It was all controlled. The only thing that changed was whether or not they told them it was indulgent or sensible. Super, super interesting. Now, the third experiment, and this one's particularly interesting when we start talking about the different ways that you can give someone a placebo. It goes back to that sort of clinical context. So in this experiment, what they did is they took participants who had what's called degenerative medial meniscus tear. They didn't have any knee arthritis or anything like that, but they had this degenerative tear. And generally, the recommendation would be to have knee surgery. What they did is they put half of the participants randomly assigned into either getting the knee surgery that would be typically done for treating this meniscus tear and The other group, they just gave sham surgery, which is essentially they still put the patient through all the operative procedures, but they don't actually do anything to the knee to treat it. Now, there were two follow-ups from this. They looked at the participants and how they reported feeling in terms of their knee one year later and two years later. In the first year, what they found was there was no significant difference between the patients feeling better. That means that on average, the amount of patients who reported feeling better in the actual group that received treatment versus the placebo group that received sham treatment were the same. Actually, the number was slightly higher in the sham treatment group, slightly higher in terms of feeling better, but it wasn't what we call significantly different. So it means by chance it could just be, you know, a couple of points higher than than the other group. So in, in terms of science, they were like, look, essentially all of these participants said that they felt better and significantly better after receiving the operation, whether it was actually a treatment or whether it was sham. They followed up with the participants two years later and they found the same thing. So the placebo was just as effective as what we think that knee surgery is for treating the knee pain. And that brings a whole heap of things into question as well, right? Like why would you put someone through an operation that's super expensive that supposedly has this effect and this you know, patient outcome when you could essentially just give them the operation, but not do anything to the knee. So you don't need that like high technical surgical ability because you're just doing sham surgery. You're not actually going in and changing anything. You're just pretending that you've gone in and changed something. And what we found through tons of experiments done in the pl- into the placebo effect is that the more invasive the treatment, or the non-treatment, the pretend treatment, the better the outcome. So patients who take a sugar pill versus patients who have acupuncture versus patients who have surgery, the more invasive, the more you will see the placebo effect come into play 
are absolutely fascinating and I'll put all the links to those experiments in the description below. Now let's have a chat about the nocebo effect. So the nocebo effect is like the dark side of the placebo effect. Essentially, it's when we have a negative outcome because we believe we'll have a negative outcome. So one of the ethical concerns for doctors is if you say to someone that they're likely to experience a side effect, that can have a nocebo effect. People are expecting a negative outcome and therefore they experience the negative outcome. Three super interesting experiments. Two of them are from a video by Ben Goldacre, which is awesome. Uh, so, so good. Ben, ben Goldacre is amazing. He's the author of the blog, Bad Science, and some really cool books as well. So I'll put the links to that in here. The first experiment actually looks at the, the placebo effect and the nocebo effect together. So I wanted to talk about that one first. So essentially what they were looking at is patients who are experiencing arm pain. And what they did is they assigned these participants to two different groups. In one group, they gave them a pill and they said, this pill will help with your arm pain. And in the second group, they did sham acupuncture, whereas essentially that is, it's not about putting the needles in any specific place. They just put the needles anywhere and they say that that will help with the arm pain. And what they saw happen was that both groups said that they felt better after receiving the treatment. But also, both groups experienced these nocebo effects and they weren't even told about them. So they weren't told that there would be any side effects. They weren't told there would be any bad effects. But the participants from both groups said they felt sluggish from receiving these treatments uh, that were actually not treatments. They were just placebos. So that kind of takes us into this nocebo world, right? That people who think they've had a treatment may also expect to experience some negative consequences of that treatment. And that brings in a, into question, like I said, ethically, whether we should be talking about things like side effects, whether we should be talking about things that could go wrong as a result of treating that patient because it sort of primes them to think that, oh, okay, I should have a negative effect from taking this drug. Okay, experiment two is another interesting one and it was done on asthma patients. It's kind of a bit of a weird experiment. It's not very nice. Uh, nocebo is a hard one to study because you don't really want to make people have, you know, bad experiences and so the ethics around it is quite tricky. So for one group, what they did is they sat participants down and they basically put this saline nebulizer on their face. Now saline solution sort of mist going into uh, the lungs of an asthma patient doesn't really do anything right, like good or bad. It kind of just has no effect, right? Um, and then they took participants in the other group and they said they did exactly the same thing. And they said that this uh, nebulizer has an irritant in it. It has an allergen and 50% of respondents had an asthma attack as a result of thinking that they were being exposed to an allergen. A bit of a nasty experiment, but demonstrates the point that this nocebo effect is very, very real. This has a physiological effect like we were seeing in the placebo effect as well. So then these experiments were taken one step further and this is where it starts to get really, really interesting. So if we look at that asthma example, instead of having something that has no effect, what experimenters now did is they started looking at giving patients active ingredients that would have an effect. Now, they tested both the placebo and the nocebo. So asthma participants were divided into two groups. One group was the placebo group. Now, what they did with the placebo group is they gave them a drug that actually would make their symptoms worse. They gave them a bronchoconstrictor. And what a bronchoconstrictor does is it essentially... Uh, constricts or closes the, the bronchioles that are responsible for getting oxygen to our lungs. So it can make asthma symptoms worse. But 50% of participants said that this drug that's actually meant to have a negative effect had a positive effect and eased their symptoms because they thought it was a bronchodilator, which is what you use to help get oxygen to the lungs. But here's the other really interesting thing. Then what they did is they gave the second group a bronchodilator, which actually does improve your symptoms. And they said, we're going to give you a bronchoconstrictor, which asthma patients know can make them feel worse. And just by saying that, the effect of that bronchodilator in easing the symptoms reduced by 50%. So just the wording that's used has a massive impact on how the patient feels. Now, the third nocebo experiment I want to explain to you sort of takes this to a whole new level. Now, they ran this experiment with six different groups. Half of the groups received 
a sugar pill, like a placebo effect pill. And the other half received a drug called carisoprodol. And what carisoprodol does is it's a muscle relaxant. Now let's talk about the placebo groups first. So one group was told that they were getting a stimulant that would actually make them feel really tense. Another group was told that they were getting a relaxant that would make them feel relaxed. And the other group was given, the third group was given no information about what the pill was meant to do. And then on the other side, we had the same thing. So these three groups were given the carisipradol. One group was told that instead of being a muscle relaxant, it was going to be a muscle stimulant. The other group was told that it was going to be a muscle relaxant. And the other group was given no information. So in the placebo group, the people who were told that they were receiving a stimulant were the most uptight and tense as a result of being told that information. But the really interesting part is what happens on the other side of the experiment. So in the three groups that were given the muscle relaxant, the group that was told they were receiving the stimulant were the most uptight out of all six groups. So even though they were given something that was a muscle relaxant, their belief that they were receiving a stimulant actually worked against them more so than in the placebo group. And part of the reason for that could be that because they could feel that there was some sort of effect on their muscle, that then they actually felt more tense as a result of it because it's like, oh, I feel like I'm actually getting the drug. Therefore, I feel really uptight and tense. So they were the most tense, even though they got the drug that should have made them feel relaxed. But the other interesting thing is that the group that received the muscle relaxant that were told they received the muscle relaxant had the highest level of the muscle relaxant in their bloodstream because they received that treatment and then they were told that it worked and therefore it had more of an effect. Now, this brings up some really interesting questions in terms of what we should be doing when it comes to how we talk to patients. And as someone who works in business, it also makes me think about how we should talk about the results that we get for our clients. Because people believing that th- through going undergoing a certain process, things will work better, actually have more of an effect. So you could argue that something like homeopathic medicine, which is essentially just like taking a sugar pill, could be quite a good thing because it doesn't harm patients, but it could have this sort of positive placebo effect. However, if you don't contextualize that correctly, and if you're a homeopath that's saying this could have a negative effect, then you also could be doing something quite unethical because patients will experience those negative effects as well. On the other side, when it comes to doctors treating patients, a lot of the time doctors need to think about, you know, how how they communicate things like side effects and also the effectiveness of the treatment. We know that if patients believe that the treatment's effective, then therefore they're going to actually potentially benefit more from that treatment. So should doctors be saying things like, look, this has a 30% chance of working, or should they say, this is going to be brilliant, this is going to solve your problem, even if they're kind of lying? I mean, for me personally, I actually think it's a really complex issue, and I don't think it's a simple right or wrong answer. So I'd be really interested in your thoughts on this. What do you think? Do you think we should be telling patients with more certainty that things will have a positive effect? Do you think we should be keeping side effects quiet? And My other question is for those of you who are working in business as consultants and coaches is should we be telling our clients that what we do has a really positive effect even if we're not sure or even if the results don't prove that they do? Should we be saying that the processes that we use will have a really positive impact on their life or on their business or on their health because we know that that will actually improve the way that they feel about it? I mean, lying to clients in order to help their business, like it does the ends justify the means? Really interested in your thoughts on that one as well. I'll see you soon for another episode of What Science Says. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe. Also tap on the notification bell to know when I'm live streaming or publishing a video next and check out what's up next for more videos from my channel.